I've done several episodes pertaining to ancient Rome. The reason is that so many of the foundational things in our world, from our alphabet to our calendar to the names of our months, can all be traced back to Rome. During those episodes, I've often talked about the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. However, many people may not realize what the difference is between the two. When did the Republic become an empire, and why? Learn more about the Roman Empire versus the Roman Republic on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by Audible.com. My audiobook recommendation today is SPQR, A History of Ancient Rome by Mary Beard. SPQR is, quite simply, one of the best books about the history of ancient Rome by one of the world's greatest Roman historians. Opening the audiobook in 63 BCE, with the famous clash between the populist aristocrat Catiline and Cicero, the renowned politician and orator, Beard animates this terrorist conspiracy, which was aimed at the very heart of the Republic, demonstrating how this singular event would presage the struggle between democracy and autocracy that would come to define much of Rome's subsequent history. You can get a free one-month trial to Audible and two free audiobooks by going to audibletrial.com slash everything everywhere, or by clicking on the link in the show notes. To understand the Roman Republic versus the Roman Empire, we have to take a step back even further to the Roman Kingdom. The Kingdom of Rome doesn't get as much attention as the other phases of Roman history, because when it was a kingdom, it was little more than a city. It was just one of many such kingdoms dotting the map on the Italian peninsula. According to legend, the first king of Rome was Romulus. He and his twin brother Remus were, again, according to legend, raised by a she-wolf. They later fought each other on where to found a city. Romulus wanted to build it on the Palatine Hill, whereas Remus wanted to build it on the Aventine Hill. Remus was then killed by Romulus, and Romulus founded the city which bore his name, Rome. This took place in 753 BC. Romulus reigned as king for many years and then passed on the throne to King Numa Pompilius after his death. There were seven kings of Rome over a period of about 250 years. The last king of Rome was Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. He was accused of raping a noblewoman named Lucretia. In the revolt which ensued, a rebellion was led against the king by one Lucius Junius Brutus. The king was exiled, and in 509 BC, Rome became a republic. Many people are confused as to exactly what a republic is. What I often hear is that people think a republic is a representative democracy. While the republic very well might be a representative democracy, a republic is really just a country without a monarchy. For example, the United States, Germany, and Ireland are all republics. Canada, Australia, Japan, Spain, and Sweden are not republics. They're monarchies. The rejection of a king and the creation of a republic was probably the single most defining thing in the history of Rome. The revulsion against having a king was burned deep into the Roman psyche. Trying to become a king was probably the biggest crime that someone could be guilty of in Rome. The system created in the republic ensured that no one person would ever be able to control Rome. Rome did not have a single leader. The highest position in Rome was the position of consul, and there were always two consuls who could veto each other. The consuls also only held power for a single year, and then couldn't run for consul again for ten years. Over the next several centuries, Rome fought with its neighbors, conquered territory, expanded, and grew. During that time, the norms and rules surrounding the Republic were upheld by pretty much everyone in Rome. This began to break down in the first century BC. Societal problems began to develop in Rome, and two civil wars broke out, leaving the general Lucius Cornelius Sulla as the dictator of Rome. Dictator was an actual legal office in Rome. It was something given to someone during a time of emergency and was only extended for six months. Sulla was dictator for three years. Moreover, he did things like create prescription lists where anyone on the list could be legally murdered and their property confiscated. This was the sort of behavior of a king. Sulla died soon after his dictatorship ended, but the impact he left on the Republic was lasting. This was the beginning of the end of the Republic and the period of Roman history that most people are familiar with. Most representations of Rome from television, movies, and the stage all come from this period of time. And the key figure in the downfall of the Republic was a guy named Julius Caesar. 
Julius Caesar was not a Roman emperor. However, he can be considered one of, if not the last major figures, of the Republic. He was extremely ambitious, talented, and one of the greatest generals in Roman history. His story is far too long to detail in a show like this, but suffice it to say, he became very powerful. He conquered Gaul, what is today modern France, which was the biggest single expansion of Rome up to that time. It made him fabulously wealthy and extremely powerful. He became the first real Roman general where his legions placed their loyalty to him before the Republic. This made everyone back in Rome jealous and frightened. They wanted Caesar arrested, and he was not going to have any of that. He took a legion and did something you just weren't supposed to do. He marched on Rome. This is where we get many of the phrases that are still with us today, such as crossing the Rubicon and the die is cast. This resulted in another civil war, a war which Caesar won. As with Sulla, Caesar was named dictator. Unlike Sulla, Caesar was named dictator for life. You might be wondering, as did a lot of people in Rome, what's the difference between a dictator for life and a king? Caesar was given tons of titles and rights. He was allowed to wear a purple toga, which was the color of royalty. He was allowed to wear a laurel on his head, which is really similar to a crown. He had a golden chair installed in the Senate. Not a throne, mind you, just a golden chair. He basically did everything that a king could do up to the point of wearing a crown and calling himself king. He was a king in all but name. All of this led to a group of senators to say enough is enough, and they assassinated Caesar to restore the Republic. This assassination was led by another Brutus, a descendant of the Brutus who removed the king almost 500 years earlier. This led to yet another civil war between the senatorial forces behind the assassination and the Caesarian forces led by his right-hand man, Marcus Antonius, a.k.a. Mark Antony, and his grandnephew that he posthumously adopted in his will, Octavian. The Caesarians won that civil war, and then started yet another civil war, this time between Octavian and Mark Anthony, which was won by Octavian. This left Octavian as the last man standing in Rome, and he's considered to be the first Roman emperor. And I really just condensed a whole lot of history down into a few paragraphs. This is really something that could take hours, if not days, to fully explain. There isn't a single date that we can point to where the Republic ended and the Empire began. Octavian was really smart. He learned lessons from Caesar. Whereas Caesar collected titles and honors and basically rubbed it in everyone's face, Octavian at least appeared to be humble. Octavian did not have the title of dictator. He simply considered himself the princeps civitatis, or the first citizen. He didn't live in a palace. He lived in a rather nice but not too opulent villa. He wore rather simple clothes. He rejected many of the honors which the Senate wished to bestow upon him. This was, of course, just an illusion. Octavian was insanely powerful. He personally owned Egypt, like all of Egypt. That alone probably made him the wealthiest person in the world at the time. He had legions directly loyal to him personally. He personally ran several other provinces. He had the power of the tribune, which allowed him to veto laws. His person was declared sacrosanct, as in no one could touch him. He was also the Pontifus Maximus, which was the highest religious position in Rome, a position also held by Julius Caesar. While all of this was happening, everything, at least in theory, was exactly the same as it was during the Republic. All of the positions, such as consul and tribune of the plebs and everything else, just kept going. It's just that behind it all was a singularly powerful guy. He was finally given the title of Augustus, which is now how he is referred to by historians. Most people had no problem with this arrangement. Rome had been rocked by almost a century of civil war, and now, finally, there was peace. If it happened to be peace under one person, well, so be it. The term Imperator was a title given to military commanders, and their authority was called Imperium. This is where our word Emperor comes from. By the end of his reign, the full name that he went by was Imperator Caesar Divi Filius Augustus. Imperator came from the title given to military commanders. Caesar came from his adoption by Julius Caesar. Divi Filius meant son of a god because Julius Caesar was deified. And Augustus was the honorific given to him by the Senate. All of those terms would be used by his successors as titles later on. Augustus wasn't just the first emperor, he was also the longest-serving emperor. 
By the time he died at the age of 75, almost no one was around who even remembered the Republic. He was 18 years old when he began to start taking power. They just assumed that one man in charge was the normal order of business. When he died, the powers passed to his adopted son Tiberius, who was called Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus. There wasn't actually an office or position called emperor. Tiberius was given a package of powers that Augustus had, and these powers were passed along to future emperors by the Senate. For all practical purposes, they had absolute control. They could do whatever they wanted with no checks on their power whatsoever, and this led to some absolutely monstrous emperors. The imperial period can be divided into two different parts, the principate and then the dominant. The principate was the first period where they at least kept up the appearances of the republic. The dominant comes from the Latin word dominus, which means lord or master. The dominant began with the emperor Domitian, and it was more despotic, and there were usually two or four co-emperors. Most historians will mark the start of the Roman Empire at the year 27 BC, when Octavian was granted the title of Augustus. The Republic can probably be considered to be dead at the year 48 BC with the Battle of Pharsalus. The 20 years in between is sort of a transition period. So, you can think of the Roman Republic as the period early on when Rome was quasi-democratic. Multiple people ruled based on laws and traditions, and there was a robust system of checks and balances. The Roman Empire was the later period where one person ruled, but they still had some of the trappings of republic. They're very different things and very distinct eras of history. The associate producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is Thor Thompson. If you'd like to support the show, please donate over at patreon.com. There is content only available to supporters, merchandise, and even opportunities for a show producer credit. If you know someone you think would enjoy the show, please share it with them. Also remember, if you leave a five-star review, I'll read your review on the show.